There is much to say when it comes to the relationship between John the Baptist and Jesus of Nazareth. Scripture asserts that they were cousins, that each were prophetic teachers, each had their own followings. It's very possible, perhaps even likely, that Jesus drew heavily from John at points in his ministry, and that John's death had a profound impact on the way that Jesus saw his own movement, pivoting away from John's emphasis on repentance for a particular kind of sin, and Jesus' emphasis then becoming repentance in order to live into a particular kind of life. But within Christianity, John's message is fundamentally necessary. That is, that his repentance seems to have been one built on what he perceived as either collaboration or coziness among religious elites with their occupiers. Such coziness may seem like a convenience or a shortcut at the time, but at what cost, he asks. A voice crying in the wilderness in John's narrative doesn't sound all that romantic, what with the camel hair and the eating of the locusts. And we might recall that examples of those voices crying out in the wilderness are usually only popular after the fact. A prophet is not welcome as in his hometown, as Jesus said. Think of people like de Gaulle. You fly to Paris now and the airport's named after him. In 1940, that would have been completely and totally laughable. MLK was loathed, Gandhi was dismissed, and the list goes on. There are other prophets, though, that can call people to repentance. Repentance is a U-turn, changing the way that people live by lifting up the truth, not as politicians, but as storytellers. We have reflected a great deal in current society on what the role of media might be in shaping discourse, and indeed these days, providing confirmation bias for people on both sides of the spectrum. But a photograph has a particular kind of power. An image can, in fact, lead to repentance. It can change us. Remember Alan Kurdi, the three-year-old Syrian boy washed ashore on a beach? That picture brought home the depths of the crisis in Europe in 2015. I said to Union the week that the picture was published that that picture means that we have to do something right now. And you all agreed. That's repentance that comes from the work of a prophet. Thomas Franklin is our guest today, and he too is a prophet. He is an award-winning photographer, multimedia journalist, documentary filmmaker, and educator. In 2015, he joined Montclair State University's School of Communication and Media. After nearly 30 years in the news industry, including 23 years at the Bergen Record and NorthJersey.com. As Katrina said earlier, he is perhaps best known for his iconic flag-raising image, but he has produced other noteworthy multimedia projects, including on the recent heroin epidemic in North Jersey and toxic dumping by the Ford Motor Company on a Native American community here in New Jersey. He is currently working on a long-term project on immigration and forced migration. In 2018, he led a team of student journalists on a reporting trip to Puerto Rico six months after Hurricane Maria ravaged the island. The TV show featuring a series of video reports resulted in numerous awards, including the RTDNA Edward R. Murrow Award, a College Television Academy Emmy Award, and the Bricker Humanitarian Award. Please, Union Kong, join me today in welcoming Mr. Thomas Franklin to our sanctuary. Uh, Dave, thank you for that great introduction, and uh, I'm really delighted to be here today. Thank you for inviting me uh, to your beautiful church here, and uh, it's really a special uh, opportunity for me to share my work with you. Um, Forced migration uh, became a subject that I uh, was always interested in, but without really being cognizant of the fact that this was uh, becoming the story of, you know, of the most recent uh, the re- most recent last couple of years, um, I I kind of backed into it uh, as uh, I started doing my documentary work. When I came to Montclair State as a full-time professor in 2015, uh, I was looking for a project that I could spend some time working on and to produce a series of reports. 
Um, what I do as a photojournalist is I report visually. I also write and produce uh, film and video, but photography and photojournalism has always been in my background and is really at the core of my interests. Um, I want to also just be really clear about what my role is as a photojournalist. My role is to go out and, and report on the stories from a, from a position of neutrality. Um, that does not mean I, I don't bring my personal experiences and opinions to the work, but I am trying to remain objective as possible so that I can understand the issues and then produce the documentary work and share it with people like yourselves. Um, I came across this quote not too long ago, and it really sums up how I feel about the issue of forced migration, and it's really a wonderful quote. Um, we, you know, we are hearing so much, seeing so much uh, about people leaving their homes, not just at the southern border of the United States and Mexico, but other, where, other places around the globe. And there, what I have discovered through my reporting is that there's more commonality than you might think um, that's going on around the world. Um, I was very happy to hear Dave mention the photograph of the young boy, Syrian child, who, uh, who drowned while tr trying to get to the European Union. And this project really began with me writing an opinion piece for Vice News. Vice had uh, asked me if I would write a piece having made the photograph from 9-11, an iconic image that had a lot to do with uh, you know, influencing people about world events. And so I was horrified at this photograph, as I'm sure many of you were. And it got me thinking about, um, about the issue of forced migration and how angry this picture made me and how um, I wanted to learn more about why this was happening. So I began my reporting shortly after writing that piece right here in Montclair. Uh, there was a local uh, uh, Jewish community that adopted a group of Syrian refugees who were living, who were who were um, placed through the International uh, Re uh, Relocation Committee in Elizabeth, and the, the the congregation had adopted these families, and so uh, this really began my foray into this reporting. Um, as a journalist, I have learned that all news is local. And if you look for it, you can see how world events and world stories are impacting your local communities. Uh, and so I did reporting for the better part of two years. I had a story published in NJ Spotlight, which is a uh, website reporting on New Jersey news. And it was this really pretty wonderful story um, of these Syrian families that were ro relocated to Elizabeth, not able to speak English, unfamiliar with the customs here. They did not choose to come to the United States. They were placed here and how they really were very, really were really struggling to adapt to life here in our country and here in New Jersey. And uh, this woman, Kate McCaffrey, who is a professor at Montclair State, which is really just coincidental, uh, and she had led uh, her synagogue in providing outreach for the families. And it was this, my reporting focused on the work that she had done, uh, including uh, raising money for one of the Syrian men to buy a, a, a commercial sewing machine so we could start to make money. They did a GoFundMe to help pay for travel expenses uh, for uh, some of the families. Uh, if you're not aware, when you're relocated to the United States, the United States government charges the refugees for their travel fees. So this refugee family uh, had a bill of like $7,000 that they were expected to start paying even before they even had any means of income. And so the synagogue stepped in and provided uh, relief and they paid off the debt for them just through donations through the synagogue. So that was the first story that I did. And then in 2017, I took a trip to Lesbos, Greece. Lesbos, Greece was the epicenter of the Syrian refugee crisis and it is still an ongoing uh, place where refugees are coming from Turkey, usually in overcrowded boats, without proper life jackets. Oftentimes, people fall off the boats and drown. And when I had gone to Lesbos, uh, the reporting was about Syri primarily Syrians, but I discovered that people from, from Iraq, Iran, other countries in the Middle East were also trying to get to the European Union. And again, I didn't really make a connection at that time between what was going on there and what was going on at the southern border of the United States. I did also did a reporting on this family. This was a family that was, uh, had traveled for two years, leaving their, uh, their bombed out home in Syria, 
making their way, they walked literally right across the country of Turkey, paid a, a smuggler to bring them in a dinghy to, to the European Union, and they, when I had met them, they were living in an abandoned schoolhouse with a bunch of other refugees. And through the donations of two sisters in New York, they were able to move out of the, uh, out of the they call it a squat, the old church that they were living in. That's what this picture here is. And uh, this was another story where um, the charity, the concern, the empathy of people elsewhere around the world had made their situation slightly better. And they were able, through the donations of these two sisters in New York, were able to move into a nicer apartment in Athens. And so I had done some documentary work on them. And that was back in 2017, uh, in, this, in the early summer of 2017. Later that summer, I had a teaching opportunity in Guadalajara, Mexico, which is in the central part of Mexico. And I was there to teach. And while I was there, I had, uh, typical as a journalist, I was looking for stories and ideas and things to go photograph. And I went by a, a shelter. And I discovered that this incredible shelter there in Guadalajara was a central hub for migrants coming from Central America trying to get to the southern U.S. border. Guadalajara is roughly in the central part of the country. Its, its reputation is, a, uh, is that of a very generous city that is fairly wealthy by Mexican standards and very charitable. And while there, I had discovered that this is where migrants would typically come and stay at this shelter, waiting to jump back on moving trains. They travel to the United States border on the tops of moving train, freight trains. The train is called La Bestia, the, the beast, and the train at times moves quite fast, and they have to run up alongside the train, latch onto one of the railings, and pull themselves up. And then they typically will ride for weeks till they can get to the United States border. Why do they travel this way? Well, one, it's the quickest way. Two, it's the cheapest way, because they don't have to pay. And three, their safety in numbers. And so typically they will go in, in packs. So while I was there teaching in Guadalajara, I would spend my free time visiting places where, where migrants from Central America would gather. Uh, this is a, an, an unofficial camp where migrants were living. Uh, this gentleman here had actually gotten injured while trying to jump on one of these moving trains. This gentleman here was actually trying to get here to New Jersey. He had tried, this was his third attempt to make it to the United States. And he, uh, when I met him, was getting ready to jump, jump on the moving train. Um, he was looking at a map in that top photograph, the shelter that I had been spending time with, they would hand out a printed out copy of the train routes. And the train routes, as you can see in that photograph, actually I don't know how well you can see it, but the map that he's looking at details the different train routes. For example, if you took the train route, train route to the west would take you to Tijuana, the Tijuana area, it was generally considered a safer route. If you took the train, the train line that would go towards Brownsville, that would be a shorter route, but the reputation was that it was much more dangerous. And by dangerous, meaning these are traveling through gang-controlled areas. The government does not have control over large parts of the country. And so safety is a constant issue. It's one of the, one of the main reasons why there, there are these migrant caravans, because riding on the trains or going independently, you have to pay off or cooperate with the gangs. And, you can imagine what, what that would be like. So I had met this fellow here, his name is Mario. Mario, when I had met him, was trying to get back from Honduras, he was traveling from Honduras, trying to get back to Miami where he lived. He had lived in Miami since he was a young teenager. His parents had put him on one of these moving trains. He had come to the United States illegally in the early 2000s, and he was living a pretty decent life in Miami. He had a child there. Uh, he was not married, but he had a child and he had a job. He was a foreman at a farm. He made good money, but his father was dying. So he chose to leave Miami to go back to Honduras to see his father one more time. When I met him, he was trying to get back. Now, obviously, he had been gone about a year and things had changed. Trump had gotten elected. There was this new awareness of illegal migration coming into the United States. And he realized that there was really a, a good chance he was not going to make it. But he basically told me, you know, that he had no life in Honduras. He actually supported President Trump and his policies, but he, ha he, he told me he had no choice. He said, what would you do? You have a child and you have a means of making income. He said he could make more in one month working on a farm in Florida than he could make in six months in Honduras. And back in Honduras, he had an ailing father and an elderly mother. 
So he basically said, I understand it's illegal. I understand you know, this is a, a problem and concern for a lot of Americans. But he said he was coming. And so I went out with him one night. He was, went out with a group of Hondurans. And they travel. They left the shelter that he had been staying in. And they would, they would walk for miles along the railroad tracks at night, trying to avoid police. And this is Mario and, and the group of Hondurans he was with, getting ready to jump on one of the trains which is where I, I, I last saw him. Uh, one of the wonders of social media and Facebook is that you can stay in touch with people so much easier nowadays. And so I was able to stay in touch with him through Facebook. And that's a photograph of Mario uh, on the upper part uh, where he had, when he had just made it to the border. Um, and the other photograph is a cell phone photo he, he sent me of them jumping on the trains uh, at another point in time. Uh, Mario did make it to the United States. He got caught by Border Patrol and was sent back to Honduras. So in, 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 the, uh, in this, this past spring, uh, over the spring break for school, I went to the southern border in Tijuana. Uh, I was really very curious to know what was going on there, right? There's so much rhetoric about the wall. Uh, I'm a curious person by nature. You know, the journalist in me said, you know, let me go over there and do some reporting from there. So I did go to the border. I spent about uh, a week in Tijuana and in the San Diego area. I made a series of pictures showing where the wall existed. This is a really good photograph that shows uh, where the wall divides Tijuana on the left and the United States on the right. In Tijuana, you can go right up to the wall. There's a highway literally right up against the wall. People couldn't go right up there. They, there's graffiti and artwork on the Mexican side. On the United States side, there's like a, a, a dead zone. It's uh, controlled by Border Patrol. Americans can't get near the border there. It is fortified uh, significantly on the United States side. Uh, I visited Ote Mesa, which is the uh, ICE facility in San Diego where detainees were being held. Um, and while there, I produced a short documentary film for HIAS. HIAS is a, a Jewish organization you may be familiar with. They're based in, in New York. Uh, they had hired me to produce this documentary on this lawyer, Luis Gonzalez. Luis is a, is a Mexican national, American citizen now, and he provides legal services, free legal services for asylum seekers in the San Diego area. He's paid by a, a foundation through HIAS. And while uh, documenting him, I, I came across this woman, and this woman's story was, just blew me away. Uh, she said, that uh, back in Honduras, her teenage daughter had been raped uh, by gang members, and she was a single mom, and her daughter had been raped, and that uh, she reported it to the police. And after she reported it to the police, they raped her daughter again. And so there were death threats on her family, and she, she dyed her hair blonde and packed everything up and brought her three children into one of these migrant caravans. She walked uh, the length of Mexico to Tijuana, which is where she uh, came into the United States and, and is seeking asylum, and Luis is providing uh, legal services for her. Luis said that the likelihood of her receiving, as, uh, receiving asylum are very slim because the, act, the, the, the allegations that she made can't be proved, and there's no the, law, the, the police has no they, he was not able to obtain any records at the police department, so people like her really are in a very difficult position. Uh, that she was in the United States at this time, but it was really only a matter of time before they sent her back. So while I was in Tijuana, uh, I did spend some time with a couple of grassroots uh, nonprofit organizations. I generally try to look for uh, positive stories whenever possible. I try to you know, look at the people who are the helpers. I find that those stories are not only interesting, that there's a great appetite from people who want to hear about, well, what is being done. And one organization I'd spent some time with there is Border Angels. I don't know if you guys are familiar with them, but they do phenomenal work. It's a real grassroots organization in San Diego. And so I spent a couple of days with them visiting shelters where they would drop off donations and food and feminine supplies. Uh, some of the shelters are really quite grim. Uh, there are no government shelters in Tijuana. It's all run by church organizations and nonprofits. This one, this photograph was taken at a shelter that's known as Little Haiti. And I was surprised to discover that there were quite a large number of Haitians also trying to get to the United States uh, through, through the Tijuana border. 
Uh, this woman here had a very interesting story. At this time, when I had taken this photograph, I had just met her. She had just arrived in a migrant caravan. She had been traveling for two months with three, with three of her children, uh, and she had no plan. She, she was just in a desperate state and really suffering from post-traumatic stress. Uh, she was planning the next day after I had taken this picture, she was just going to uh, hire a smuggler to, car to carry her across the border. She didn't care if she got caught. She said, I, I just want, once you, can, once you step foot into, on the United States side, you can seek asylum. The other option for, for, for migrants like herself is to go through the formal process, which would be to put your name on a list, and then it would take weeks before they call your name, and then when they call your name, you can officially apply for asylum, and then they're gonna put you in ICE detention. Or in some cases, if you have family in the area, they may let you go. It's, it's the, the circumstances are very uncertain for people like her. Uh, I traveled up and down the border in California there. There are parts, uh, this is in the city of Tecate. Tecate is actually divided by the wall. Uh, on the Mexico side, it's a very populated city. On the United States side, it's really a very small town. And it's very fortified along uh, these areas. But it was pretty obvious to me that, you know, that a wall would not really keep people from coming. On the Tijuana, on the Tecate side, there were people who had ladders propped up against the wall, right? And so even if Border Patrol were to able patrol the entire length of the wall, it, it really would not be a very effective way uh, for keeping people out. And while I was in Tecate, I did meet a number of people. I, I met one couple, for example, uh, and they were American, and they were from San Diego. And the man, uh, the, the couple were probably in their 60s, and he was alling quite a bit. He walked with a cane. And he was going to Tecate, Mexico to get medical treatment. He had no insurance in the United States. And he said that this was a very common thing, that the medical care in Tecate in particular was very good, and so that he could go there, pay cash, and it was significantly less expensive than getting medical treatment in San Diego. Um, and then all along the border there, and San Isidro was essentially the, uh, the, the, the San Diego side of the border wall. Um, on the Tijuana side, it's uh, on the beach, it's called La Playa, the beach area, is an area where migrants typically congregate. And it was a fascinating place. It was kind of like a, a beach hangout, uh, refugee migration area where people would, you know, spend their days and frequently just look across the wall at the United States on the other side, you know, conjuring up what life might be on the other side. So I was doing my reporting there one day and I had, um, I had a, a young jour a Mexican journalist who was working with me, her name was Carla, and Carla was helping me with translations and she had some, some access there. And we met this guy, I'm going to call him Y, and Y said he had just arrived from Honduras, he had walked with his chi young child, and that he could not spend another night in a shelter, and he said he was going to sneak across the wall. And so we started asking, well, how are you going to do that? Because in La Playa, there, the, the, the steel wall goes up about 20 feet, and then there's a, a metal fence right up against it, and there's barbed wire on top of that, and then there's border patrol on top of that, and then it's like four miles to the next town. So we were like, dude, how are, you, how are you gonna do that? And he said, I had a plan. And we just said, well, okay. And we didn't really think much of it. And then a couple hours later, we did see, I was uh, at a distance and I saw people pushing the fence and he slipped through uh, the border. And this is a photograph of him running with his young child. He's now on the American side. I'm taking the picture from the Tijuana side. And he ran the four miles carrying his child to the next town. Now you might ask, well, you know, how did he get away with that? What I believe he did was he had timed it. He had been there for a couple of days. He had timed the shift change with Border Patrol. And he had timed it so that when they were on a shift change, that's when he made his run. And it was quite a scene, and there were people cheering him on. And, um, and while this was going on, uh, this is one of the more interesting things that had happened, he, uh, we had, uh, talked to one of his friends who did not go through, and his name was Jay, and Jay said that, you know, that he, he had traveled all the way from Honduras with Y, and Carl and I had exchanged emails and, and um, uh, 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 cell phone numbers with each other, and that night he had called us and told us that Y had actually made it safely to the first town, and he offered us an opportunity to do an exclusive interview with him if we would drive him to, to, to Los Angeles.
And so I had an eth ethical dilemma there. And so um, while uh, I would have liked to have helped him, that would have been fairly unethical of me as a journalist. And so we sent him some, uh, we sent him Border Angels contact information. Um, and then again, one of the cool things about social media is that I was able to stay in touch with him. And he's currently living in Baltimore where, he, where his mother lives. But he's in, a really, he's in a significant predicament there because he cannot apply for asylum where he is. He's there with his young child. Uh, his, his wife or fiance lives there. She's here legally. Uh, and he can't apply for asylum. If he does, he's going to get turned over to ICE immediately. So he's uh, kind of in a, in a predicament. Um, I don't want to go on too long here, but uh, the next day after Y had made it through, a group of people tried to do the same thing. And they made it through, but Border Patrol was waiting for them, and they were all arrested, including Jay, Y's friend that I had uh, just told you about. Uh, I was really blown away at how much uh, the nonprofits and grassroots organizations there do. Uh, not only Border Angels, but there were many others who just, um, who just want to try and, you know, help as, as best they can. I met a guy from New York City who was on vacation in Los Angeles with his family, and he had a free day. So he drove down to Border Angels in San Diego and said, I'll help today. And then they all went to Target, bought a bunch of supplies, drove it across the border into Tijuana, and then dispersed them. Uh, and that was a really cool thing to see happen. Uh, this is a young college student who was letting one of the migrant children play, play with her hair. Uh, and then also with Border Angels, um, one of the cool things that they do about once a month, they lead, lead what they call a water drop. They drive far out into the desert near the border wall in San Diego, out in, the, in the desert outside San Diego. And they hike into the, into, the, into the desert and they leave water bottles along the trails that migrants typically take. And so I had accompanied a group of college students from Utah who were there on their spring break doing some, some outreach work. And these photographs were taken while they were leaving these water bottles um, along drainage ditch areas, any place where migrants you know, would typically um, cross paths while trying to get to the, after they cross over into the United States. Uh, this is an interesting photograph. This is a photograph of, a, of a, a piece of fabric that was sewed together, and migrants would typically wear stuff like this on their feet so they don't leave footprints in the, in the desert for Border Patrol to see. Um, and then this last set of photographs here were uh, taken in a potter's field in a, in a cemetery that Border Angels had worked with the county to create. Uh, so when they find the dead bodies of migrants who, who either freeze to death or, or die from dehydration, uh, they bury them in this cemetery. Uh, Border Angels helps maintain the cemetery, and the students from Utah visited that cemetery and uh, placed wooden crosses uh, there along the unmarked graves. So um, that's, that's all I have to show you. I appreciate your time for taking a look at it, uh, at my work. If you want to contact me, here's my contact information. Uh, all the photographs and the stories that I have written are on my website, uh, or actually on my blog, which you can get to my name, thomasefranklin.com. Uh, you can access my blog through there as well. And um, I thank you very much for your time.